We're finally doing a DS9 episode. Ah, brilliant. We're doing a sport episode. Are you kidding me? Chris, I know as much about sport as I do brain surgery. Hi folks, and welcome to the ups and downs based on your votes. Yes, retro ups and downs, having so much fun with this series. And I love the fact that we're finally covering a Deep Space Nine episode. I say finally, you're going, Sean, it's episode three. And I'm thinking, what of it? More importantly, we get to cover a sport episode, which makes me really, really happy because I know a lot about sport. We are this week looking at Take Me Out to the Holosuite, which I, look, I remember cracking up the first time I watched this. And I watched it again, obviously in preparation for this, and I'm laughing at all the same bits, which, you know, points for consistency. We have our podcast that drops every Tuesday, so if you wanna get a question in for that, if you wanna get in touch, just do hashtag Ask Trek Culture, and we will go through those, and we will pick up whatever questions you have, and we will discuss it on the pod. Now, let's play ball. Take Me Out to the Holosuite is the fourth episode in the final season of Deep Space Nine. So at this stage, we've had, uh, uh, spoilers, you know, we're just coming off the back of the death of Jadzia. We've just come off the entire opening where Cisco has lost his way. They're looking for the orb of the emissary. We have Romulans, we have blockade of Vul Bajoran moons. You know, it's pretty serious. And then, of course, we have Garrick and Esri massively butting heads in the episode just before this. So, naturally, let's play a big game of baseball. Now, behind the scenes, they knew they had to lighten the mood somewhat. And they'd also been tossing around the idea. Ha, <laughs> tossing around. Almost like playing catch. Yeah, get ready for these. The idea of doing a baseball episode in like, season four, in season five, in season six. And each time, it just hadn't felt right when it comes to the timing of the episode. Knowing that they were coming off the back of heavy episodes and they were heading in to heavy episodes, big up the siege of AR-558 coming up soon, they needed something to take a breath. So the first up of the week is the light tone of the episode. It also, I suppose in, in a way, it's, it's sort of a life goes on reminder as well that even in this massive dark interstellar war you must find the light moments when you can uh the fact that it comes off the back of solok being such a dick kind of makes it even funnier in my book the starship Tecumbra docks at Deep Space Nine and Captain Solok, an old rival of Ben Sisko's, arrives, immediately begins criticizing how the station is run, inefficient, you know, this and that. Basically, he's a dick. He's like the worst version of a Vulcan we've yet seen. And I am including Cybok in that. You know, at least Cybok had that cool haircut going for him and that laugh. And initially you catch yourself thinking, did, did Cisco kick his cat or something? Because you're thinking, why is he such a dick? You know, this is this is a lot. Even for a Vulcan, this is a lot. We will find out the backstory, but before any of that, Solok says, I wish to procure one of your holodecks. To which Cisco says, talk to Quark. Next thing, Solok is leaving the captain's office and Cisco says to Kira, get everyone together in the wardroom right now. Okay, crap, have we got an offensive coming? We are in the middle of a war, like... No, it's even more devastating than a Dominion fleet on the horizon. The Vulcans have challenged Cisco's crew to a game of baseball. Yeah. Sitting in the wardroom, you get what is to become the first of just so many great one-liners from Worf. We will destroy them. Taken up. I love as well just how quickly everyone's on board. You know, again, you know, look at the context of what's happening. At any moment, a Cardassian Dominion fleet could come swooping through the quadrant and say they're going to spend two weeks practicing to play baseball. And I love it. It goes back to what I said. It's realistic. You find the light in the dark where you can. And it's, yeah, every, everyone's on board. And this is before they even know why Cisco is as... Mm. There's also a great moment, the, the reveal, if you like, of it's going to be baseball. And you just see Kira's face drops taken up nana visitor uh we'll discuss this a little bit more when we come to the temporal observations but nana visitor had every reason for her face to drop at that moment esri bashir and o'brien are sitting in quarks they're going through the rules and the next thing lita and rom sort of kind of they 
look, can we try out? We'd love to be a part of it. And with that and more taken up, this is all of the main cast and our long-standing regulars are in this episode. So every named character in the credits, but also Lita, Rom and Nog are all in this episode. And that's a lot of fun. We also get Cassidy Yates, uh, which who I will discuss quite a bit as we go on. But that to me is one of the strongest things of Deep Space Nine in general. All of the Star Trek series have their main cast and they're brilliant. But I would go so far as to say that Deep Space Nine is the one who used their supporting cast the best. And episodes like this remind you why. Because they're all bloody brilliant. And it's so much fun seeing them all together. There's also, as tryouts begin, something that Deep Space Nine, I think, as much as it tried to put this forward, what it didn't always lead with was Jake and Ben's relationship. Now, there's, there's dozens of examples where, uh, yeah, it did. But what I mean is that they might go with big gaps in the middle and seeing them together on the baseball field was brilliant. And I really appreciated that because Sorok Lofton, again, if you're gonna do a baseball episode, make sure Sorok Lofton is in it, temporal observations. But that's, that's what they do. It's what the Cisco's do is baseball. Tryouts begin and, I mean, understandable, People are, eh, you know, because they don't know how to play. It's, it's new. You can expect people like Worf and Bashir, and they are called out immediately by Cisco to be particularly skilled with hand-eye coordination. Of course, Worf, Klingon warrior, Bashir, genetically engineered. So you're kind of like, right, they're going to be fine. Esri, as we, as we learn in a bit, you know, has a memory of being a gymnast. We'll see how that goes. Nog, peak physical fitness, he's a Starfleet officer. Robin Quark, maybe not so much. Uh, there is a fabulous, just little, just little visual gag in this. It's a, so you have tryouts and generally people where they are uniformed are wearing their uniform. And you have Colonel Kira, who is wearing, you know, doesn't have the jacket on, but the rest of the Bajoran uniform and baseball cleats. I just, it, that's enough. I do have a down. To explain this down, uh, I kind of I, I both have to ignore behind the scenes information, but I am going to discuss that. Don't get me wrong. Colonel Kira is woeful. I mean, come on, is there anything she hasn't done in terms like hand to hand combat? She's one of the best people on the station for that. Think of all the experience she has. And I mean, it's not that like, you can fight doesn't mean you can play baseball. You can probably catch a ball. And I thought like, you know, I'm there watching poor old Kira is just like, kind of thought she'd be better at this than she was. And yes, there is a behind the scenes reason, but in, in the episode as presented, I thought, come on, she should be a wee bit better than that. Another down, I suppose I kind of want to get out of the way, but if you think of the way that the Vulcans are discussed in this episode, Solok, the rest of his crew, the Logicians, which by the way, brilliant name for a baseball team, Smug, Vulcan, Arrogant, da, da, da. It's a bit racist against Vulcans this episode, I'm not gonna lie to you. You know, like you're kind of like watching this going like, Spock was nice though. So was Tuvok. All right, Vorik could be a bit of an arsehole sometimes. They really don't like Vulcans on this station, do they? Which actually, when you think of the events of Field of Fire, which will come later on in the season, I guess there's some sort of justification for that. But yeah, it's all a bit racist, isn't it? A very obvious up for this episode is going to Avery Brooks. He's brilliant anyway, but he's so different from your normal Captain Sisko in this episode. Because this is Sisko, the baseball fan. This is not necessarily Sisko, the Starfleet captain. It's the same character and Avery play plays them so differently. I think I, 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 I might be inventing this memory. It was a while ago, to be fair. But I do think I remember the first time watching this being just like, why is he so different? Whereas now I completely appreciate the fact that because he let go. Now there is, there's bits to that as well, but Avery plays Cisco so passionately here. I know, what a shock, Avery's passionate in his performance. But about baseball and you can see it the way he interacts with Jake you see it the way he interacts with Cassidy the rest of the team and he plays a blinder after tryouts everyone's in the infirmary and I just pff, taken up 
I literally, in my notes, in, in my notes here, I have Rom will kill them all. He's smashed the back of Quark's head with his bat. He's done damage to Worf, Rom, run. Uh, I just, uh, it's just, there's so many little gags in this scene. And you have Esri, now she's talking about, you know, Emini was uh, an Olympic gymnast. I should be able to move like that. It, one of many references to the fact like, yes, your former host could do this. You are not them. But yeah, I can, I can totally understand the frustration. Think of things that we've all done in our past uh, that for whatever reason we can't do anymore. Uh, yeah, there is a kind of, we should be able to do this, this is stupid. I, I keep saying, temporal observation, temporal observations. Um, all right, look, I'm gonna do one temporal observation now because it's too funny not to, and it's O'Brien's shoulder. O'Brien Must Suffer is a trope in Deep Space Nine. We've done a list on O'Brien Must Suffer, okay? So, like, that's, there are enough examples. But O'Brien's shoulder is a carryover from the next generation, even. And it's always the right shoulder. And you knew as soon as he walked around that corner and he's holding his arm, you're like, O'Brien's oh, out of the game. Simple as. Uh, and, and he confirms it. So uh, Cisco makes him coach. Th those who can't play coach, bit harsh. But just it's just gas. And he's like, oh, I'm really sorry, Captain. I, I wanted to play and everything. It's just like, O'Brien, I would never say to someone, ah, just chop off the shoulder and get a new one. But for the love of God, man, chop off the shoulder and get a new one, will you? But... That reference alone, that's enough. What you do get here as well is sort of the beginning of what will become Cisco's irritation. He bounces back very quickly. As I say, he makes O'Brien coach, but you can see he's not happy. And it's not that he's not happy. Oh, darn, that's frustrating. It's like, what? Lop off the shoulder, get a new one. He swallows it down and it comes. Now, <laughs> down. We gotta be honest here, Cisco's a bit of a prick in this episode. Now we know the reasons for it after a little bit, and you know, that's that that that's fine. That 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 helps that completely helps save the character. But I mean, he's really a bit of a prick in this episode. Particularly, obviously, against poor Rom. It makes more sense when you think of Rom did just try and kill the entire senior staff of Deep Space Nine. And you know, alright, fair enough. That would be something that needs to be looked at. But yeah, Cisco's a little bit of a bully in this episode and he does you know kind of like i suppose serious for a second he completely lets it get to his head we've seen shades of this before think of cisco v michael eddington and yes all right you're like really that's the comparison we're going with solok has has just needled him and needled him and needled him and has wound him up and cisco has a history of this remember the last time someone wound him up he poisoned a planet You'd think by season seven, he might have tried to get a bit of a handle on that. Now, the very person for the job of calming down our errant captain is the wonderful Cassidy Yates. I love her. I, I, I love Cassidy Yates. Um, Penny Johnson Gerald is just, she's just everything, isn't she? So, you know, having her arrive, uh, even though I do love that exchange where she's like, Oh my God, all of my roots got rerouted for the next couple of weeks. Who knew? And, uh, you know, bureaucrats, right? Who knows? And Cisco's like, hmm, who knows? They have such a natural relationship, such a natural banter between them. Uh, so getting to see them have that banter and also in a new context as well, the context of the game, it, it's really refreshing. And also she can speak to Cisco in a way that nobody else can. Imagine Worf. Tried to walk up and call out the captain on his... Well, first of all, Worf probably supports the captain on his behaviour. But let's say Worf tried to go up and call out the captain on his behaviour. Well, Worf is intimidated by Cisco, so he probably wouldn't. I'd forgotten about that one. Uh, she's there, and she's playing, and, she's, and she just slots into the game. No problem. This is what I mean as well. The entire supporting cast is so good. My close to Latinum up of the episode. Okay? Close to, not quite, Odo the Umpire. If you need a person who's gonna follow the rules, you get Odo. And it's exactly what they do. Cisco stands there and he says, look, I need you to be my umpire. And Odo's kind of like, I mean, I literally have a station security to run. I'm really not sure I have the time. No, he, he agrees straight away. And I'm delighted he did. However, down, can you stop being horrible to holograms? I mean, like, all right, so Cisco says, you know, I could have a holographic umpire, but that's just a collection of photons and force fields. I need a real person. I really hope Vic Fontaine's not listening to this. 
I mean, he's literally on the station. I think at this point he has switched off. He doesn't get to be on full time until a few episodes later. But I think of the emergency medical control, it's so funny how horrible Star Trek is about holograms sometimes. You know? Like, we invented this wonderful thing. They are sentient. We have shown that they are sentient several times. They are worth the spittle on my shoes. He's not good at baseball, is our Rom. And Solok, again, getting in the captain's head, sitting in the stands, scouting out the, the practice. Rom, he tries. He tries. He tries to hit the ball so hard, he flings around, lands on the ground. And the next thing, he sends the bat flying over Jake's head. And... This precipitates him getting chucked out of the team. And it's quite sad, because he's like, I mean, if you need heart on your team, it's Rom. It's as simple as that. And even when he's chucked off the team, everyone, well, not Worf, but <laughs> everyone else, rallies around to say, we're not playing if you're not playing. And Rom is the very one to be like, no, don't I mean like, look, I'm not good at the sport. Go and have a good time and I will be there supporting you literally the best man which leads into a scene then of cisco <sighs> cassidy's there trying to get some of the knots out of his back because the stress is somewhat intense and he goes oh tell me something i don't know she's right you're lifting your foot on the plate and she's like what and he's like no stand up all right take a swing and he does he lifts his foot and she's like right there and he lets the bat drop in and there's a lot of frustration this and cassidy's just like oh i know that look i want to smash things up but she'll think i'm crazy it's your quarters swing away my friend I love this woman. But we get the main reason. We get why Cisco hates Solok as much as he does. Back at the academy, he was drinking. Solok walk into the bar. A few exchanges later, Cisco challenges Solok to a wrestling match. Look, I would not like to get in a wrestling match with Cisco in his prime. But Solok is a Vulcan. They are naturally three times as strong as humans. There was there was no question. And yep, Cisco ends up in the infirmary. He's got detached shoulder, broken ribs, and a very bruised ego, as he says. You know, Cisco's honesty in this scene is very refreshing because obviously we just saw him be flipping horrible to Rom. And again, talk about again, Avery Brooks, talk about the range he's showing in this episode. Uh, but he gives the entire backstory to Cassidy and he's just like, right. Cassidy just goes, tell the team, that's only gonna encourage them. And he's like, absolutely not, no. And he comes over and he's being very cute about it and he's kissing her on the neck and he's like, no, you can't tell, I need you to promise. You can't tell them either. She goes, fine, I promise. Team meeting, up. Burst out laughing the first time, burst out laughing this time. I love Cassidy because Cassidy knows the team needs to know that. You know, as Worf says, you know, this man is without honor, honor and logic sometimes. And basically, Solok has neither. But they do. They take this as the encouragement it was intended to be. And that's crucial. So <laughs> then, oh my God, there is a moment. Now, I don't know if this was intentional or not, but O'Brien is the one who says, right, come on, team, we're going to get them. And he puts his right hand down on the table, big truck of dirt just drove past, and there is a palpable hesitation in the room. Surely they're all thinking, we're gonna tap him, that arm's gonna fall off. With that, it's time to play ball. The game begins, um, and there is, there's chaos. But in the beginning, it's like, right, okay, let's let's get some chatter going, let's get some chatter going. Hey, batter, 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 hey, batter, batter, batter. Death to the opposition. Up. Oh. Just Worf, man. Just Worf. The Vulcan team are the first ones to bat. And yeah. So basically they start racking up the scores and they're doing pretty well. They're Vulcans. You would expect them to do well. But I mean, the Niners have been training for two weeks. Surely they're going to be very good. They're not very good. No, no, they're not very good. They're not very cohesive. Their skills are not amazing. And um, yeah, fun. Also, ah, rivalry between Kira and one of the Vulcan teammates, uh, which actually, oh, they're playing the game by late 20th century rules. That is because a takeout slide is perfectly legal in the 90s when this was filmed. Now, that was then revised later on in the real world so that that move would not be legal. Now, someone did his homework. Tying in with those rules is what that Vulcan does a little bit later on, which is not hitting the plate. 
when they run home, which leads to the hilarious scene of Nog tapping out every member of the Vulcan team. Also, Nog, mate, run up and tap them all. Don't stop and check after each one. Anyway, but in the 1990s, Yes, yes, they, 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 they followed those, those rules. However, that was also revised once, you know, they, they, they didn't tap the home plate. They weren't home. Nog could have just tapped the ball on the home plate and put that player out. There is one, th 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 for me, there's an obvious down in this game of baseball, right? And it's not to do with the Niners not being the strongest team. I mean, we knew they weren't going to be. It's Worf and Bashir striking out as often as they do. The two that were specifically called out as the two best, basically, physical, you know, again, hand-eye coordination. I, I don't know if it was a mistake to have them striking out as much as it was, but it does feel like a very odd decision. Um, I mean, think about Bashir and darts. He can't miss the bullseye. He literally can't, which means he should be, you know, if there was any member of the team that was getting home runs, it should have been Bashir. You know, down after that, are you telling me Worf's never hit a small thing with a stick before? You know, think of episodes like Birthright, where he's throwing the, uh, the, the, the word escapes me, you're probably screaming it at the screen, and you're right to chase me on this one, but throwing the javelin through the hoop. I, 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 that was, for me, that felt a bit kind of like, mm, really, those characters? You know, maybe have Jake, right? Who is obviously, he is a baseball player. He knows what he's doing. Now, obviously he's the pitcher, but you know, kind of, he's, he's, he's fine. You know, and if Odo called a strike on one of his attempts, that would easily, plus it would be fun to have an our father and son. I don't mean bullying Odo, but to have them go like, we know baseball, we know baseball. And Odo just quote the rules at them. Uh, because of course it's Worf's strike three that causes the big bust up between Odo and Cisco. Uh, so, my down standing as leading into my up, which is just how much Cisco leans in to, you know, you you stole that from us. You stole that as much as you, you reached out and took that away. And, and he taps Odo. And Odo just goes, you're out. And Cisco's like, what? Like, you can't touch the umpire. And in the heat of the moment, you can just see, you're like, you can see it on Cisco's face. You know, you're just like, he's just like, oh, he's right. He's absolutely right. There is no arguing. And Odo does it in the most Odo way possible. Uh, you know, kind of, here is the rule, you know, rule, da 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 da, -da subsection, da 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 da. Check it out in the stands because you're off the pitch. Go. And I mean, it, there, there's that moment where I think if Cisco had a phaser. But anyway, listen, he stomps off the pitch, stomps into the stands. And, you know, Solok is there, the smug prick, just been like, mm. and then he's up beside Ram and, you know, poor old Ram was like, yeah, I'm gonna die. Going back for a moment to the Vulcan who never tapped home is, you know, and Nog's like, hang on. And they say, he never tapped home, Nog. And he goes, what do I do? Find him and kill him. Up. Oh, and you know what? My latinum up of the episode is bloody Worf. Worf is my latinum up of this episode because the humor is so well paced out. Worf is funny. And he doesn't get to be funny all of the time. Nog manages to take the Vulcan out, which leads to Cisco finally unwinding. And I think it's a bit of a case of the, the wood for the trees with Cisco, because baseball's his game, this is his team, this is his station, and Solok's a prick. So once he's kind of out of the game in insofar as he's watching, he's able to kind of go, wait a minute. Because he sees his team enjoying it. And no better man to be beside him is Rom. You know, it looks like a lot of fun. And Cisco's like, do you know what? What am I doing here? Rom, come on, get in the game. And better late than never, Rom rocks up and he bunts them into one score. Okay, li listen, they still lose the game by a lot. But that's not the point at this stage. At this stage, it's about what they did together as a team and lifting up, quite literally, in Rom's case, everyone on the team so that they're enjoying it together. It is such a cathartic moment. Uh, also, I maintain, right, I think that Vulcan defected at the end of the day. That pitcher, like, threw it with such accuracy against Rom's bat. I think that Vulcan handed them a point. 
you know, Solok then storms onto the pitch and he's like, you know, because th they're all celebrating. I was like, this is completely improper, umpire. You must send him out. And of course he taps Odo. No, actually, he kind of grabs Odo. Yeah, Cisco tapped Odo. Solok grabbed him. And Odo's smile is just up. Oh, you can tell he enjoyed that one. You know, we, 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 we cut then to Quarks. Everyone is celebrating a game well lost. Because that's what it was. It was, it was to play. And Solok is, you're attempting to manufacture victory where, or manufacture triumph where none exists. Uh, you know, they give a toast to manufactured triumph. Fun thing to note here, because I was watching this episode again today and I was like, who's that fella sitting behind O'Brien that's done up to look like Worf? That's not Michael Dorn. And I was right, it wasn't. Michael Dorn and Rene Auberge and were actually not available for this scene of filming, so it's their photo doubles. But yeah, it's, it's a great scene of just Cisco apologizing to Rom. Lovely. Everyone enjoying themselves. Lovely. Jake. This is brilliant. Jake's the only one who's like, we still lost the game. Like, beautiful moment between Brooks and Ciroc. And it's, you know, it's kind of like, you know, kind of, you know, I, I let 10 get home. And he was like, look, if this was against humans, it would only be like two or three. Just that banter. Um, I've pff, taken up. There's also, uh, I have no control over this. There, There is a rule when it comes to a Deep Space Nine episode. I see Morn up. They, they continue with some of the old anti-Vulcan statements, but there is that thing where he goes, you know, such a human condition. And Ezri goes, did I forget to put my spots on? Which I, I've always loved. Solox stamps out after. They all sign the baseball and toss it to Cisco. And Cisco goes, would you like to sign it? But the best thing for me and the up of this is Quark's signature on the baseball has lobes around the queue. And I absolutely love it. That's the end of our main episode. But would you take a trip with me to temporal observations. Now, this week's temporal observations. So we're going to start with the ship itself, the Tecumbra. So this is a Nebula class ship that was first introduced all the way back in the Next Generation's episode, The Wounded. It was a slightly different configuration then for the USS Phoenix. This footage is actually a reuse of the footage from the second season episode, Second Sight. So actually, when we think we're looking at the Tecumbra, we're actually looking at the Prometheus. The Tecumbra is also an entirely Vulcan crewed ship. Now we've had ships that have entirely Vulcan crews before. Back in the original series, we had the USS Intrepid, which was lost with all hands in the episode of the Immunity Syndrome. We also had the USS Hera. Now that was not entirely Vulcan, but it was predominantly Vulcan. Unfortunately, that ship was lost, including its captain, Captain Sylvia LaForge. Yep, Geordie's mum. Solok references the fact that he's just received his second Captain Christopher Pike Medal of Valor. This is a reference to Cisco getting his Pike Medal of Valor in Tears of the Prophets a few episodes earlier, and also a whopping reference to Captain Hairstyle himself, Christopher Pike. Now, some eggs behind the scenes info, take it the way you want. So, Kira, I mentioned Kira's face dropping when, when earlier on, you know, like, you know, oh, it's gonna be baseball. So, Nana Visitor was easily the worst player behind the scenes. So my down for Kira not being as good as she was still stands, but I'm also going to cut a bit of slack because poor Elden and Avisitor, she just couldn't play. Uh, and conversely, I think this is well known at this point, but Max Grudenschik was like a semi-professional baseball player in college before he went into acting. So that's why Rom plays left-handed. Max is right-handed and, you know, he, he knew what he was doing. So he had to, basically the, the, the thought process being that if they let Max play right-handed and try to play badly, it was going to look like a good player trying to play badly. So they made him play left-handed. So actually, yes, he was playing badly. Obviously, we've gone through some of them already. For example, O'Brien's shoulder. But there's another O'Brien one, long story medium. So he infuses chewing gum with the flavor of scotch. All right. So this is the, you know, the first time Bashir's ever experienced chewing gum. That's fine. I, I just want to say... Scotch is vile. That's just my opinion. If scotch is your favorite drink, I'm very, very happy for you. But I, I, I can think of nothing less fun to, uh, to, to, to make chewing gum taste like. But also, fun fact about Sean, I don't chew gum. There you are. Do with that information what you will. So nothing about this scene is appealing to me. 
Cisco has a lovely 3D chess set in his room. Also, we get references to Starfleet Academy. Uh, Odo practicing his umpire rules. Uh, again, we... Uh, <laughs> Mr. Sports Historian over here, we already covered the fact that those rules would have changed. Yep, in the, uh, in, in, in the 400 years, or 300 years, excuse me, between the, with this episode being filmed and the game taking place. There's actually, now there's a big whopper one, which is baseball itself. Obviously, look, dozens and dozens and dozens of references within DS9. But actually, it is as much a reference to both Michael Piller and Ira Stephen Bear as anything. Michael Piller, Baseball was his favorite sport. And one of the first things he did getting a job as a writer on Star Trek is to remove it from existence. You know, in his very first script, he said, baseball died out in the 21st century on Earth. Ira, in an interview, said that basically this was Michael's deal with the universe. He had to kill something he loved to do something he loved. And OK, so then getting to do a baseball episode was in a very roundabout way, sort of way of bringing it back both for Michael and for everyone who was just enjoying the sport. Ira, the reference here is that the plot of this episode is quite similar to a season four episode of the TV series Fame, that old bald game that Ira Stephen Bear actually wrote. We get references like the bunt, that's from the episode, um, you know, tagging out each of the players. That was as much in the episode of Fame as it was, apparently Ira said, this was something that happened to me in Little Leagues. Like, this was a real thing, I, you know, that this was based on. And I love little bits, like, just how these things connect. So yeah, so the next time someone says, you know, all right, six degrees of separation, Deep Space Nine and fame, you can do it in one. Another big whopper of an egg that takes a little bit of, of a dive is the hat that both Jake and Ben are wearing during tryouts. The San Francisco Giants and the Atlanta Braves both of which were teams that Ciroc Lofton's uncle, Major League Baseball player Kenny Lofton, had and would play for. When the game starts, there is a piece of music that plays, and it is, to date, the only time that the anthem of the United Federation of Planets has ever been heard. Thank you, composer David Bell, for writing that. The logicians all have IDIC logos on their uniforms. I love that one. Cassidy's number on the team is number 47. There's just 47s everywhere. Cisco's number. Uh, so Avery Brooks requested to have the same number as Major League Baseball player Dick Allen. Now, I then did my due diligence and went to start. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna do some research on this baseball player. Do yourself a favor and go and learn about Dick Allen. Because that man is fascinating. I'm just gonna throw a couple of stats for you here really quickly. In his career, he scored 351 home runs and had a batting average of 0.292. I am told that is good. Uh, the home runs one, I, I do get that one. There is there is so much, you can trace so much of the growth and reversion, I guess, of sports in the United States through the 20th century through this man's career. So I, I definitely recommend go and find out more about Dick Allen. When Cisco is uh, having a moment with Odo, he goes, what were you doing, regenerating? I enjoyed that one, I'm not going to lie. Also, I didn't call it out in the episode and I am a fool for not doing so, but Esri Dax scoring her fancy Dan. I love that, completely love that scene altogether. The Vulcan who doesn't strike the home base and then sits down, technically, is that Vulcan lying? And then one, one final thing, which is, it's kind of funny. So Lita only ever has the name Lita on her journey. Journey? Jer Jersey. Uh, perhaps understandable. Whereas Kira, depending on the scene, is Kira or Norris. Yeah, I've always just found that a little bit funny. Because technically it's right. And technically it's also, was that just a mix up at the uh, costume department? Hmm. Either way, I'm here for it. There you are. That's everything now for our lovely sports episode. Um, let us know what you thought. Did you enjoy this one? Do you want us to cover more lighthearted episodes like this? Or do you want to be like, you know, oh, I'd rather, I'd rather do darker things. So do let us know. The poll will be up in the next couple of days. Make sure that you vote and 
get, you know, kind of get it, you know, get your voice out there as well. Just, just, because we want to know. We want to know. Thank you, everyone. Now, remember, follow us on the Twitters at, at Trek Culture. We're over on Instagram at Trek Culture YT. We're on TikTok. We're on Blue Sky. I'm at Sean Ferrick on the various socials. And Chris is, of course, at Edit Chris Edit on t Twitter and Instagram as well. Until I see you again, folks, make sure that you live long and prosper. Make sure that you look after yourselves. Make sure that whatever happens and whatever you're doing, lead with kindness, lead with love, and put a little bit of brightness out into the world. In the spirit of an episode like this, let's just have a little bit of fun, if we can. You're awesome. You're wonderful. Have an amazing time till I see you again. Make it so. <laughs>